Okay, so up to now we've um, only talked about uh, ideal cycles and the ideal processes, and what makes up these thermodynamic cycles. And in this section, I'm just going to talk about um, obviously what we have in reality isn't real. Uh, sorry, isn't ideal. We have um, it does differ from those cycles. So I'm going to talk about those differences in this section. So what you see in front of you here is this is the um, PV diagram for the Otto cycle. Um, obviously, this is the ideal one on the left, and this is a real one here on the right. I'm just going to talk about the differences as we um, go around this cycle. Um, so hopefully you can see that they're kind of uh, different shapes. Um, now, the main difference, or one difference probably noted straight away is, in our ideal cycle, we assumed that no work was done during the induction and the exhaust stroke. Um, in reality, that's um, not the case. Work is done during the expansion and induction strokes, and collectively, these are known as pump and losses. So you can see the work is done uh, in the system, and this is to induct and expel um, the exhaust gases um, from cycle to cycle. We assume that process one to two is um, isentropic compression. Uh, in reality, that's not the case, although actually out of all of these processes, this is probably um, the closest we get to ideal. Um, but because of uh, crevice effects and leakage um, past the, the piston rings, it's not uh, isentropic uh, compression. And also, if you notice, I've kind of deliberately drawn this, it's not to scale, but um, for an indication, you can see that P2 here is lower than P2 here because the pressure you have at the end of um, the compression stroke in a real engine isn't what you would have ideally because of these uh, leakage effects. We do have uh, heat transfer during combustion. So in our ideal cycle, we said this was isochoric um, Combustion into in the sense that we said the combustion was infinite, so there was no change in volume, and we had infinite uh, heat. Heat was released instantaneously, we so we had an associated instantaneous pressure rise. Uh, obviously, in the real world, that's not the case. Um, we do have um, uh, uh, the combustion process is finite, so you can also see that um, the peak pressure. Um, occurs after top dead centre, not at top dead centre, which is really where you want it to be, but it occurs after. And so we do have heat, the heat transfer um, during that combustion, combustion process. So P3 isn't um, uh, as high as it would be. So you can see, again, I've kind of drawn it to scale a little bit there, that um, your peak pressure isn't as high as it would be because of these this heat transfer. Uh, the reason that... Um, so the combustion process is finite, um, so we initiate combustion before we want it. And uh, this is the challenge of the engine designer. They try and get as close to top dead centre as they dare. But obviously if they get it wrong um, and you've got peak pressure kind of occurring um, or the pressure building in the cylinder too much before, um, before top dead centre, then basically you're trying to compress the gas that's expanding. So that has quite detrimental impact on the overall efficiency of the engine. During the um, uh, power stroke, um, we have heat transfer, um, so it doesn't quite follow this uh, nice isentropic process, it falls below that. We also have incomplete combustion, uh, which is um, you know, a big, again, challenge to the engine designer to try and uh, design this engine in the mix in um, so that they can um, make full use of all the chemical energy that's available and approximately 5% is lost. And then finally, um, rather than having the isochoric heat rejection, the exhaust valves need to be opened um, before bottom dead centre to allow time for the exhaust gases to escape prior to inducting in the new charge. So again, this pulls it back um, below the, the isentropic uh, line as well. So you can see all there's all these things that are going on, um, all the challenges that we have uh, that mean that we can't achieve uh, what we want um, in theory. So um, just going to talk about, um, so even though, um, so this is our real cycle and we've said that, you know, we've got incomplete combustion, heat transfer and everything. But still, this isn't always what we get at the wheel. Um, 
we have what are called um, indicated, so a net indicated power and gross indicated power. So um, you can see I've color coded the PV diagram over here. And the red is um, just the compression and um, power stroke only. And the blue is our, the induction and um, the exhaust stroke. So the net indicated power um, is the cyclical integral is it's a work which is done as a cyclical integral as you go from one to two, three, four, five, back to one. So that includes the red bit, if you like, and the blue bit. So that's the net indicated work is what you should be getting out. But sometimes engine designers talk in terms of the gross indicated work. In other words, what you would get um, just from um, the power stroke if you could neglect your uh, pumping losses so that's the red bit only and then obviously the difference of those two is um, or rather than the net is the sum of the gross and the pumping is the blue bit which is the pumping losses and it's a work between done between the piston and gases during the the inlet and the exhaust as I say and uh, we talk about indicated work and actually um, the PV diagram in still some old uh, automotive books is referred to as an indicator diagram um, referring to the to the work that it, that it represents so um, that's what we have in the engine um, sorry from the cylinder so from the indicator diagram we can get um, an indication of the amount of work that the uh, uh, the engine is doing for each cylinder but that's still not what we get um, that's delivered to the wheels because of um, okay we've got the pumping losses but you still have additional losses in the engine uh, mechanical losses due to friction etc etc and the way we can measure the, what actually comes out of the engine uh, is with an engine dyno and that's called the brake power and so called because what we're doing is we're effectively applying a brake to the engine to measure the amount of torque um, that it's producing so um, this is measured with a dynamometer and the way that it works is uh, the engine is connected to the dyno, so the, the rotor, the red bit in the middle, and that rotates. And basically it's resisted by the stator on the outside. And the the torque, um, when it's balanced, the torque uh, that's being applied to, to the, by the engine to the rotor is measured by using, by measuring the load in this load cell, you know the force that's being applied on this arm. And you know what uh, lever arm that's being acted over because that's lever arm B. So you can work out the torque um, uh, being applied from the engine. You want to get that into power. So the torque is obviously um, FB. And therefore the power is um, it, it's the rotational uh, component of the velocity of that. So it's 2 pi N where N is the um, engine speed times by the torque. And that gives you the brake power. Um, a quite simple test was developed um, called the Morse test to determine the indicated power and frictional losses in an engine and it, it looks fairly involved but it's quite um, simple um, in its, in its uh, conception really and basically what it does is it involves just taking a number of uh, quite simple uh, measurements on an engine so for a fixed speed and throttle position, and that's important, the power is recorded with all the cylinders active. Okay, so you can get like a baseline um, power for the engine. Um, what happens then is one cylinder is, de is um, deactivated or made inactive. Um, and the power is then recorded for the engine with one cylinder one inactive, that's repeated with cylinder two inactive cylinder three and so on for as many um, cylinders are in the engine okay and then once you've got all those that information then we can use that information to determine um, the indicator power for the engine and consequently the uh, frictional uh, losses in the engine as well so how do we do that well first of all uh, so we're working on this assumption so we're saying that the um, the total Great power from the engine 
is equal to the indicated power minus any frictional losses okay and so if that's for the total engine then for each individual cylinder the brake power is the indicated power for that cylinder minus the friction for that cylinder therefore for a four cylinder engine if we um, where n is um, and it's from one to four we can rewrite this as the indicated power of all our four um, from all our four cylinders minus the frictional losses from all of our four cylinders but we know because we've from our results so we've measured the power for when each um, cylinder was deactivated. so when we deactivated cylinder one then the power that we measured for cylinder one was the indicated power from the remaining cylinders so notice i2 3 and 4 not i1 minus but we still got the friction losses from 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 so from this we can determine what the indicated and power ones because if we do the if we sub minus this from this what we're we left with we're left with i1 because everything else cancels so the indicated power now is the total power minus the break at 1 we can then do that for each of the cylinders. So if we do B total minus B2, we end up with I2 and so on. So we can do it for each of the cylinders. We end up with the indicated power for each cylinder. So we can then find the total indicated power for the engine minus that from the total. And then we've also found the frictional um, losses for, for the whole engine as well. Okay, so that was just obviously concentrated on the uh, reciprocating engines, but um, the gas turbine and the Brayton cycle have their own um, inefficiencies. And these are generally um, talked about in terms of the isentropic efficiency of both the um, uh, compressor and the turbine, respectively. So if we look at this in terms of a TS plot, so what we're showing is we're going from uh, pressure 1 to 2, uh, from the compressor and then down from 3 to 4 which is the same as um, constant pressure if we assume obviously constant pressure combustion and heat rejection then if um, the uh, compressor is uh, isentropic then it's reversible so we could, it would be a straight line on this plot but we know that that's not the case it won't be we we have to put in more work than is actually required so where we don't we don't end up at 2s which is 2 at the subscript s referring to the isentropic it being the isentropic point we we'll actually end up here um, and conversely when we're um, coming um, back from the turbine um, we don't extract as much work as we would like we end up extracting um, uh, extracting less you know entropy's got to increase or stay the same so um, we end up with, with less workout, so we end up with here. So we can write the efficiency of the um, compressor as uh, the change in enthalpies, or we can bring those to te um, back to the temperatures. So we can write it as a function of temperatures, but it's slightly different for the turbine, because obviously um, you, you're trying to do it the, 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 the other way around. So we've now got um, isentropic efficiencies written for the compressor in terms of temperature and for the uh, turbine in terms of temperature. Okay, and that um, concludes uh, this lecture on thermodynamic cycles. If you've got any comments or queries, then just leave them below or, um, or come and see me. Thanks.